<coughs> okay, so this is section on the RN technology. And uh, this is the outline. We will introduce the principle of the RN and the device properties and the physical mechanisms and performance uh, metrics and some of the reintegration and macro chip demonstrations and uh, last we will discuss the possible applications for this technology and the ARA is one of the emerging technologies we've discussed before and uh, actually it has two subcategory uh, one is called the OXAN run which is based on this oxygen vacancy and the other one is called the CB run, uh, is short for the conductive bridge random access memory, which is based on the metal ion diffusion. So we will look at the mechanisms in the next. Uh, but uh, to start with, so the R run, or say this OX run structure is very simple. So you have two terminal device, three layer, uh, two electrode kind of metal, and then separated by the oxide layer, which is typically very thin, like a few nanometer here, a few nanometer, maybe 10 nanometer or less. So this is the typical IV characteristics of this device, and uh, this is uh, in the log scale of the current. So initially the current is very small, and then when you increase with the voltage uh, beyond some threshold voltage, it will set to from the high resistance state, HRS, to the low re resistance state, LRS. And then if you want to switch back, then you have to reverse the voltage polarity to the negative, and then the device will reset from the low resistance state to the high resistance state. So you can use those two states to represent 0 and 1. Of course, you can try to program the device into different resistance states, so you can do the multi-level operations as well. So this is a basic uh, structure of the device and the basic IV characteristics of the device. So I think this IV is tested uh, in one of the samples I fabricated in Stanford Clean Room. So maybe 10 years ago. And uh, the other category is this CB run, conductive run, uh, conductive bridge and then access memory. So in this case, uh, steel is a two terminal device and the three layers, two electrode and one insulator. Or sometimes we call it solid electrolyte. So here the difference is that one of the electrode needs to be active. Active means typically use silver or copper as the electrode. So when you apply voltage initially, this is <coughs> insulating, so current is very small. And when you apply positive voltage on the active electrode, for example in this case silver, we are going to oxidize the saver and it will become saver ion, which is positively charged. So you, this positive bias will drive the ion into this solid electrolyte. So the ion will migrate across this electrolyte and then will deposit at the other side of the electrode. So you are going to grow this uh, filament or bridge from this electrode to the saver. And eventually when you have this bridge formed, then you will have the current flow. The saver essentially is met metal, so you can have current flow. So then that's why you turn on the device here, set the device to the low resonance state. And then if you reverse the voltage polarity here, so because the, if now you apply positive voltage to the platinum side in this case, so the positive voltage will drive the 
saver ion back to the saver electrode. So you are going to rupture the bridge and then the device will switch from the low wind state to the high wind state. So this is the, the mechanism of the CB run. So basically you form the metallic bridge between two electrodes. Here the electrolyte is again coupled with massive magnetic yeah, <coughs> so quite thin, and tens of nanometer, let's say. Yeah. So this uh, electrolyte can be charbogenite, oxide, nitride, even amorphous silica, amorphous carbon, or even polymer. So as long as the silver and the copper can diffuse across those materials, you can always create this bridge. Do you have chances to have multiple channels at the same time? It's possible, yes. So depending on the roughness, right? If you have surface roughness of those, and then if you have thinner, uh, let's say, thickness between those two electrodes, then you may form the filament or bridge there. If you have multiple spots on those weak locations, you may have multiple so, if you have a larger area, there's a greater chance of multiple filaments? Uh, well, it depends. So, if you form the first filament, then you are going to short the other filament. So, most of the current will flow through the first filament. So, the current will be concentrated. So the chances to for multiple filament will reduce. And then for the oxide run, the material is choice. And if you look at the periodic table, uh, here are the yellow elements, okay, whose oxide have shown this kind of resistive switching behavior uh, in the literature. And uh, when I started this kind of research 12, 13 years ago, uh, at that time, I mean, any student uh, go to the lab and pick one metal and then oxidize that metal in oxygen. Okay, you flow some oxygen and make it oxide and then de deposit two metal pads and measure the current versus voltage across those two pads, you will see some resistance change and you can publish your paper. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was like 12 or 15 years ago. So uh, now I think industry has uh, focused on a few elements here uh, because those elements show better uh, resistive switching behavior and also those materials are used already in the foundry, like the hafnium, zirconium, tantalum, aluminum. So those are CMOS fabrication friendly materials. And uh, here are the key attributes and the state of the art metrics uh, in terms of the performance. Uh, the read and write speed can be less than 10 nanoseconds, for, typically for the RN. And uh, the programming voltage, like 1 to 3 volts. And uh, the programming current, like uh, tens of microamps to 100 microamps. And the cycling endurance from the papers can be like 10 to power 6 to 10 to power 12. And the retention, people projected that larger than 10 years at 85 degrees C. And uh, the scalability has been proven to be less than 10 nanometer. Even there are some papers showing that 2 nanometer by 2 nanometer devices. And uh, as I said, the material sets compatible with the CMOS because we will use those elements. And there's a low temperature processing. So when you deposit those oxide, you use the temperature below like 300 degrees C, so it's compatible with the back end of the lamp process, which means you can do that between metal layers in the interconnect, like metal 4 and metal 5. So then you can deposit that uh, after the front end the transistor complete. So those are the metrics, and uh, those numbers uh, seems good, uh, but the challenge is not all the numbers uh, show up simultaneously in one device. Okay, maybe some device 
is good at some aspects. So this is one challenge. The second challenge is that uh, some of the, those numbers are measured only, let's say, by a single device, not across the wafer. So how to make sure, let's say, most of the cells in one wafer can satisfy all those uh, uh, metrics is another challenge. So basically the yield is another challenge. Okay, so let's look at some of the uh, examples from those two research institutes. One is ETRI from Taiwan, and one is IMAC from Belgium. So those two research institutes really pioneered in the RN research. So this is uh, the 1T1R cell from ETRI, Taiwan. So ETRI is a research institute. It's like a national lab in Taiwan. And uh, if you know the history, TSMC is a spin-off company from the ETRI back in 1980-something, 1886. So this is a research lab. And uh, this is 1T1R. Uh, one transistor, and then you can put the RN stack uh, in this contact aware of the drain of this transistor. And uh, in this case, uh, it will use hafnium oxide as the uh, RN switching material. And here are some zooming uh, TM image. You can see the uh, diameter of this uh, contact aware, like 30 nanometer, and hafnium oxide only like 5 nanometer thick. So this is the main switch layer. And the tinitride is the electrode, it's conductive. So this is the typical IV characteristics. Uh, it's similar as what I measured from my sample. Right. So you look at the shape. So this is always people will test as a uh, DC sweep. And then we need to test the metrics like uh, endurance, right? Cycling endurance. So here is the endurance uh, cycling. So basically, you apply the set and reset pulse, like 1.5 volts for set, negative 1.4 volt for reset. And then you, after set, then you read the resistance. And then after reset, you read another resistance. So this is one cycle. And you repeat this. So here you see the resistance change over cycles. Essentially, this is your memory window, right? You want the on and off states to be separated. So this is from one single cell, and you repeat this to, for 10 to power 6 cycles. So you still have some window. So this is good. So you will change the memory resistance when you try to me measure the resistance? Uh, when you measure the resistance, you always use small voltage. When you read, Right. For all those memory cells, when you read, you use small voltage. When you write, you use large voltage. So set and reset are right. So they use like a large voltage, 1.5 volts. When you read, probably you only use 0.2 volts to read. Okay. So here is the and also uh, they tested the switching speed and uh, through some dedicated uh, setup and uh, the. But is the set pulse they can apply is like 300 picoseconds, 0.3 nanoseconds. So uh, after this 300 picoseconds, you see the resistance can change, right? Using this kind of voltage condition. So you see the resistance flipped. So that means the switching is successful, uh, like uh, below nanosecond. And then the data retention, because this is non-volatile memory, you need to do that. And uh, typically, you need to bake the sample at higher temperature. And uh, here is uh, the baking experiment. You read the resistance as a function of time at high temperature. And uh, this is not good, I would say, OK. So what they show in this paper is that they just uh, extrapolate for 10 years, which is not good, because the failure may happen like this. Okay. So this is not a good way to do the testing. So, but we have 
discussed what is the best way to do this. Any idea? I think that's in also in one of your homework this time. So this cell is capable of this multi-level cell operation, MLC. And uh, the way you do the MLC in the RN device is that you uh, partially set or partially reset by tuning the programming condition. For example, in the reset voltage and in the DC sweep, you can reset at using different voltage here, so you can get different resistance levels. And all in the set operation, you can use a transistor 21R, right? So you can tune that transistor skate voltage, so you can control how much current you can flow. So this is called the compliance current. And then you, by tuning the transistor skate, you can control the maximum current you can flow. So you can make the set stop at different uh, resistance level here. So this is the way you control the resistance. And after you program to different resistance states, you can also check the retention of the different states. You also bake and then look at the uh, 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 shift of the resistance over time. So this is uh, MLC. And this paper was published uh, in like, uh, 2008. So it's really one of the earliest, earliest paper. And uh, after that, IMAC, uh, which is a research institute in Belgium, and uh, it, it is an industry, a research alliance, so basically uh, that uh, Intel or Samsung, they all pay IMAC for doing research. So in the IMAC's uh, design, it's also a half oxide based R1 device, uh, but this iMac paper first for the first time proves that this device can be scaled down to 10 nanometer in the scale. So here are some images for the uh, device uh, under the TEM. So it's really a cross point array. A cross, sorry, this is not cross point array, but this cell is in this cross bar structure. But then later here we still have the transistor to control that. So it's 21R. And the diameter is like a 10 nanometer for this device. So uh, here are some figures from that paper. Uh, one thing they checked that is the forming voltage. So what is forming? So this is a big problem for the R1. So for the R1 devices, for the first time, you may need to do the so-called forming process. Uh, this is to apply a relatively large voltage to trigger the switching behavior. And uh, this is because typically the oxide is insulating and you need a large voltage, for example 3 volt, 5 volts, to trigger the switching. And then later in the subsequent cycles, you can just use like 1 volt or 2 volts to cycle it. But the first programming, you really need a large voltage and this is called the forming process. So this paper checks the forming voltage dependence on the cell area or the thickness uh, of the electrode. And uh, I will not go into the details, but the conclusion from this figure shows that this is a fundamental mechanism of the situation. Because for different area, they don't see too much difference in the forming voltage. And then they also check the set reset voltage and amount ratio of this device with respect to the cell size. And again, they don't find too much dependence of those parameters on the cell area. This also suggests that this is a fundamental switching mechanism. What is fundamental switching mechanism? This is what we discussed. We have this uh, conductive bridge we vary locally, like maybe 10 nanometer in scale. So no matter how large your device is, right, your device is like 1 micrometer, 100 nanometer, <coughs> or even 20 nanometer, doesn't matter because your filament is only like 10 nanometer in diameter, and you may only have one or two. So no matter how large your device is, then your other parameters 
will not change because all of the conduction is concentrated along that 10 nanometer bridge. This is called filament. And there are some trade offs uh, in the speed uh, versus uh, voltage. And as you can imagine, that if you want to switch the cell faster, then you have to apply voltage larger. So this is uh, because when you drive those ions uh, moving in the uh, oxide, you have to use larger voltage to accelerate the migration of those ions. And again, the endurance, okay, cycling endurance. So in the IMAX study, it finds that the endurance failure will have different mode depending on the set and reset condition. So for example here, this is a resistance measured over cycles. And sometimes the failure is that both, let's say, the LRS will become HRS and the device is stuck at HRS. So this is uh, where the device stuck. And sometimes where the device may stuck at the LRS. So this is because the relative strength of the set and reset pulse. You, if you use stronger reset pulse, stronger means, for example, the reset pulse may have larger amplitude or longer pulse width. Then you keep resetting, resetting more. And eventually, the device will be stuck at the reset state, which is a high rhythm state. But if you tune the parameter to make the set pulse to be stronger, like you use larger voltage for the set, then you keep setting the device. Eventually, the device will stuck at the low rhythm, low rhythm state. So how do you optimize the programming condition will determine the cycling endurance. And by their optimized condition, they can get that here 10 to power 10 cycles. Uh, you keep giving it a set uh, input at your whole uh, at your electrode, and a filament is formed, and it becomes kind of tough to break after. Yes, exactly. So, what's the case for reset? Uh, reset. Uh, if you keep uh, uh, reset stronger, that means you are going to uh, drive more ions. Uh, let's say you are going to rupture your filament uh, more and more, and it's very hard to recover that. Uh, filament. So it's a relative, uh, let's say, formation or rupture of the filament. So it's really relative. And we will see the mechanism later. You will understand this better. And uh, then the retention, of course, this is a better way to do this. Okay, this temperature accelerated uh, retention test. So what you really need to do is to uh, measure the resistance, for example, low resistance state, as a function of the time at different temperature. Okay, so you measure it at, for example, here uh, at 250 degrees C, 200 C, 150 C for the LRS or HRS state. So you will monitor the current, readout current as a function of time. So you will see the degradation. And then you are going to draw a line here, for example, the LRS. You are going to draw a line here to define the failure point. So if you, the resistance or current drop to this point, you think it's failure at this temperature, the other point here, and the other point here. So for three different temperature, you can get three failure points. That means three time here. Then you are going to draw this one over KT plot, and uh, uh, you are going to convert the temperature to the KT, and uh, then you have the three different time points here in the log, log scale, in the log scale, and this is one over KT scale. So if you do that, then 
the straight line can be extrapolated. So the slope of this straight line will give you the EA. That is the slope. This is the activation energy. Basically, this is a parameter in the exponential function. So this EA is a slope here. And then you can extrapolate okay, to lower temperature, or let's say to 10 years. So 10 years here is the tip. If you convert to seconds, it's like 3 10 times 10 to the power 8 seconds. And then you will have this point, and you can read out what is the temperature. Of course, you need to convert back from the KT to the temperature in the sensors here, like 105. Okay. So that means this cell can sustain the baking at 105 degrees C for 10 years. So you have this homework. And this method is true, not only for this R1, it's true for any number that have memory, like flash, phase change, 3D exponent, whatever. So this is a generic uh, method. Any questions? You need to practice this in your homework.